Guys, this is Jacob from RoboFlow. Today we're going to talk about various metrics in computer vision and build our way up to the mean average precision metric. So starting out, why would we care about the mean average precision metric in computer vision? The 5,000 foot summary is that it gives you a great view of the way your model is performing versus other models on the same test data set. This summary is very useful as you're working through experiments, maybe by enhancing your training data or changing your training set or changing your model architecture, and it can give you a very boiled down metric of how to compare advancements with each of those different technique changes. So looking at a roadmap of what we're gonna go through today. First, we're gonna look at just test images and see some test inference to see why we're going through this mean average precision uh, tutorial and, how, and see if we can just determined by looking at test images which model is better. After that, we're going to start to build some technical infrastructure by looking at what the precision recall curve is and how we might calculate it. After that, we're going to look at the intersection over union metrics so we can determine when we're making object detection detections, which one is counted as correct and which one is not counted as correct. And then after that, we're going to use the IOU threshold to start drawing MAP curves and then for each of our class labels in our class data set, we're going to draw an MAP curve and then we're going to average over that to find the final MAP metric. Once we've gone through the theory of what MAP is, we're going to put it into practice again by looking at our models that are inferencing in our inference example and we're going to determine which model is actually better using the MAP metric in practice. So now, moving forward, let's say we have two object detectors. We've trained them on the same training data, and now we want to decide which is better. So in this example, we've trained two custom detectors on blood cell images. Basically, the blood cell images look like this, where there's a bunch of red blood cells, and there's a white blood cell, and there's some platelets. And we want the object detector to be able to draw bounding boxes around each one of those cells, and then once it's drawing a bounding box, identify which type of cell that that cell is that it has drawn in a bounding box. So first off, we have a model here. This is a state-of-the-art model. It's called YOLO V3. And now we have another model right here. This one's called Efficient at D0. And we are holding these up side by side and we're trying to determine which one we want to use. And so here we, we can see some example predictions. Uh, we see here that YOLO V3 is doing a very nice job of identifying red blood cells and it has a white blood cell here and platelets. It seems like it's doing a good job, as is Efficient at. Um, they're both doing a pretty good job identifying red blood cells and white blood cells. But here you can see efficient debt is, you know, making maybe a few too many predictions. It has a red blood cell box in the middle of two red blood cells and looks like it's doing that up here too. So maybe from this point of view, we would want to pick Yola V3 and say that that's just the better model. However, this doesn't really seem to be the most robust way to go about things. We might, we, we probably want a way to look at these models, model predictions across the entire test data set and do this evaluation programmatically. So when we run different experiments, we don't have to be squinting at each different image. Um, so now we're gonna go through the infrastructure to make such a calculation. So before we get into the MAP metric, which is the final metric that we're building up to, we need to first understand what the precision recall curve is. The precision recall curve is basically a way of visualizing the way that your model is performing as you're decreasing the confidence threshold that your model is making predictions at. So jumping back to those test images here, we see that our model makes a bounding box prediction, it makes a class prediction, and then it also assigns a confidence value to that prediction. So here we can see it's pretty sure about white blood cells, that's a confidence of 0.94, but a little bit less sure about this red blood cell, that's only 0.48. So you can threshold the number of predictions you're making by adjusting a threshold on this confidence metric. And now looking at these, these metrics of recall and precision, recall is basically a measure of, of all the true positives out there, how many of them has your model correctly guessed? So basically, have you guessed enough times when there is something to guess? Now, precision is, is another, another view of things where it's basically like every time you guess, did you make a correct prediction? So you can see that you can trade off precision so you can get less precise by making more predictions at lower confidence, which gives you a higher recall. So the precision recall curve is downward sloping because you're losing precision as you're making more and more predictions, which is giving you more recall. Now that we have sort of an understanding of what the precision recall curve is, 
we can start to look at aggregate metrics. These are aggregate metrics that summarize the entire precision recall curve. The first one is the F1 score. The F1 score is a single estimate of the precision recall curve where you're multiplying precision and recall together and you're hitting a single point and that single point is giving you an F1 score back. Um, the second kind of aggregate metric is area under the curve where you can integrate under the precision recall curve and count all the space underneath and say, okay, how much of this graph mass am I actually getting in terms of being have it, having precision while I'm moving across the recall curve? Now, the final one, which is most important to this tutorial, is the average precision metric. The average precision metric looks at your precision floating point estimate at, a various, at various points along the recall curve. So you might look at it at like eight, nine, 10 different spots where you're looking at what kind of precision you're getting at at each of those, at each of those recall spots. And then you're averaging across all of, those, all of those precision floating point values. And so AP is very important because that is ultimately what is gonna go in and feed our MIP calculation. So moving onwards. In object detection, we need to have a way to decide if a given prediction was correct. Um, so going back to what we're doing in object detection, we're, we're making a bounding box prediction around an object. And with that, after that bounding box prediction is made, we're guessing which object class has been predicted. So here we have X values and Y values where the bounding box is being formed. And then on top, we have an object class where we're deciding what the object is. Now, in order to determine which, is, which predictions are correct, we need to form some sort of metric, which is the IOU, the intersection over union, between the ground truth bounding box in our test data set and the predicted bounding box that our model is predicting. So here we could represent the test data set box as a blue box and the prediction as a green box. The IOU is the amount of overlap between those two boxes. And as we're increasing the IOU, we're requiring the model to make a closer and closer prediction to the true bounding box. And as we're decreasing the IOU, we're making it easier and easier for the model to be considered correct by only requiring a little bit of overlap to be made. Now that we have the concept of IOU, we can start to see how MAP is calculated across various IOU metrics. So here we have a picture of us drawing MAP curves. Uh, this is just a visual depiction, um, but it gives you a sense of what the programs are doing underneath the calculations. Uh, here you can see we have an AP curve for every class. Now, if we look at specifically at red blood cell, we have this top line, this orange line here, which is basically the precision recall curve with the most lenient IOU metric. So maybe we have an IOU metric threshold here of, let's say only 0 0.1. So only 10% of that little overlapping box needs to match up with, with, the, with the test ground truth box. And so that's, that's easier for the model to get and therefore the precision recall curve is higher. Um, now here in the red, we have the, high, have the most stringent um, IOU, maybe, maybe it's 90% overlap needs to be, needs to be made to, to be counting the prediction as correct. And that's why the precision recall curve drops off a lot faster. So with MAP, we're taking that across a various slew of IU, IOU thresholds, maybe 0 0.9, 0 0.8, 0 0.7, all the way down to 0.2. And we're, then we're taking it across all of the different classes. So we're separating out the test data set into different predictions and different classes. And then we're taking the mean across all of those AP curves. And so we're taking the mean of all of these different precision floating point estimates, which really gives us a very robust way to look at the data set. Now we've looked at the test data set across every single class, and we've looked at it across a bunch of different IOU metrics, which means that we can't get caught in some sort of uh, tricky scenario where one model is doing better and under one IOU threshold and another is doing better on another IOU threshold or one model is doing better on one class and the other one's doing better on another class. We've really split it out in terms of a way that the model has to be doing better in every sense in order for it to get a better MAP. So now we're gonna take a look and we're gonna take the theory into practice and we're gonna discuss some real life MAP results. So remember 
going all the way back to us squinting at test images, we're trying to decide which blood cell detector is better uh, because we're going to deploy this model in production and we want to be able to deliver the best possible model. So looking at the MAP results, if we look at the MAP results for efficient dead, we see that we got a 78% AP on platelets, whereas for yellow V3, we got 72%. For red blood cells, efficient debt gets 78%, whereas for yellow V3, it's only getting 74% here. And for white blood cells, we're seeing 96% for efficient debt, and we're seeing 95% for yellow V3. So there's a few things we can start to glean from this. Um, it definitely seems like white blood cells are an easier thing to detect. That makes sense. They're a very large purple object in the very middle of the image. Um, or, or wherever they are in the image, they're very large and they're very easy to detect, whereas red blood cells are more numerous, they're a little bit more meshed together, and platelets are, are smaller and they only appear in a few places. So it makes sense that white blood cells would be the easiest thing to detect, but it's good to see the, quanti the, the quantifying of, of those results to see that our intuition is correct on that. And then finally, we can look at the final MAP metric, which Here's the great reveal. Efficient debt does better than YOLO V3 by almost 4% AP. So that means that efficient debt is definitely clearly the better model to be using across, if you look at the MAP metric across all of our test data set. And I will, will bring up the point that this was contrary to our original intuition by just looking at these, these test images. So this is a great case in point of why it is so important to look at a metric like MAP when you're evaluating your models because you want to get a very robust view across the entire the entire test data set before you decide that one model is is better than another so uh, in summary we have done a deep dive here of what the map metric is for computer vision it is a very effective way to look at results across your entire test data set and decide which model is better than another and finally if you've enjoyed this video uh, you can please subscribe uh, underneath and you can also see under there I've put a blog link where I'm talking about all this stuff, uh, all of this stuff in depth in a, in a blog post. And, and then finally, you know, one great way to increase your MAP is to use RoboFlow. RoboFlow allows you to generate uh, a massive amount of training data from a base training data set. And it is a great way to be comparing your model and running different experiments and, and increasing your, your MAP for, for many days to come. So stay tuned. Thanks.